So, uh, we have discussed the uh, 18th century in the context of uh, this novel and uh, now there will be ramifications about this novel, the way it was received in the 19th and 20th centuries and the question that it raised in a different background later. And uh, Dr. Pail Nagpal, I request you to uh, share your next points regarding yes. this. So, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, volume 1 uh, of this particular novel, so the, I mean, the whole idea of uh, the life and opinions of uh, Tristram Shandy suggests the idea of a build up or the idea of a Bildungsroma. Now, this claim is completely belied because there is no sense of growth of the protagonist. There is a protagonist mentioned in the title, and the titular uh, protagonist is not born till about book three, as mentioned, and you know, then appears briefly, uh, you know, towards uh, the end of the novel, and really speaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, does not contribute in the way we think that this protagonist is going to develop and contribute. Yet at the same time, when we look at the opinions, the opinions that we have are of, you know, Tristram, the writer narrator, because it's a story that's being told. And we have Stern, the writer, and we also have Tristram in the novel, who kind of, you know, takes on different mantles at different points. And Tristram is not simply, a, a, you know, a character waiting to be born, but the 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 normal uh, you know kind of course in the development of the novel is totally rejected here so uh, the novel in that sense makes a distinction between the 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 character the writer and uh, you know here we have of course the whole idea of the meta text and also you know meta writer because uh, this is a sense that we just do not have till the 20th century but here is a text that is there within the whole uh, you know, text uh, that uh, Stern is writing and, you know, how there are different um, uh, roles that are taken on by Tristram, by his father Walter too. So, uh, whose opinions are we really speaking look at? So, we need to ask these questions and, uh, you know, we probably of course get to know more about, let's say, Uncle Toby in the novel than we do about, uh, uh, you know, Tristram in that sense in terms of Stern's protagonist. So, what is really speaking the purpose of this displacement? I've called it a displacement. Now, there can be many consequences. Firstly, by, you know, undercutting in a sense the titular hero, the protagonist and deflecting attention to another character, we can see that whatever Tristan writes and narrates is also sat being satirized. I think this idea of wit and humor is being used in a very, very specific, in terms of a specific uh, strategy by the writer and, the uh, you know, uh, of a, a specific uh, authorial and narratorial strategy. So, uh, you know, the way it works its way in the text is, uh, you know, very different from uh, the way things were being written at the time. So, uh, what is, uh, you know, the question as I said is, what is the purpose of this uh, displacement? So, the deflection uh, is not simply to other characters. It's not as if, you know, there is no Tristram and we move to other characters, but the narrative that is weaved by Tristram in this novel is also something that we really speaking need to kind of look at. So, these are, there are digressions, there are movements away from, you know, hardly any story except for maybe the story of the fly that's completed. So, these opinions are, you know, kind of presented by, espoused by Tristram are satirized simply by the fact that he is not yet born. So, we have the frame of the text within that text, that is we have the frame of Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. Within that, there are other uh, authorial, narratorial uh, uh, methods that are being deployed. And because the, the, the titular pro protagonist is not born till about, you know, the first two books and we are talking not about, uh, you know, his birth from the beginning, but we are talking about his begetting. So, uh, there we can see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Stern is also kind of, you know, laughing at what is really speaking happening. So, and of course, we do have, you know, the whole uh, uh, microcosmic Shandy uh, household. So, uh, we we spoke about, uh, you know, beginnings and uh, the whole idea that, you know, there is a tendency to latch straight on to, you know, uh, the, the beginning or the first story. Now, the, the beginning here is the ab ovo. Ab ovo is in the egg or immediately, you know, the, the, the whole idea of not from birth, but, you know, from before that, from the very beginning. So, what do we mean by the beginning, really speaking? I think just a point that uh, Professor Prakash also raised that we, we normally would expect 
within a conventional bildungs roma structure to look at the protagonist from the point of view of birth now by actually talking not of birth but of by talking about begetting uh stern is totally rejecting that and is asking you know asking of course you know what does it mean to be born and when can we you know we pin a date but really what are we really speaking doing when we do that and in this sense stern is doing something very important something that i think only literary theory begins to do in the late 20th century which is you know countering this established idea that there was a beginning you know it could be a it could be the whole idea of creation it could be the whole idea of the uh, of a myth somewhere so this idea of the beginning is contested the very first page of the novel contests this idea so the connections uh you know and i'm uh, quoting uh, wolfgang eisa here that the connections between natural and historical processes thus undergo remarkable inversion in the history type of novel the hero's birth is the natural precondition for the unfolding of his story for tristram the birth stands at the end of an infinitely expanding range of prehistories so i i want to just draw attention here that not only is the whole idea of the beginning contested but the idea of history is also contested through it and we are in a sense talking about prehistories you know history you know kind of looking at things from the moment of birth and uh, you know in in historical construction itself within the discipline of history this of course has huge ramifications so underlying history is a teleological ordering of its purpose but tristram's pre birth life stories are all marked by the workings of chance so for example uh, you know this is a quote from uh, book 1 chapter 1 the most important one really speaking where the mother says in that moment of uh, you know begetting uh, pre my dear quote my mother have you not forgot to wind up the clock good god cried my father making an exclamation but taking care to moderate his voice at the same time did ever woman since the creation of the world interrupt a man with such a silly question so and tristram here is narrating in a sense this moment and uh this brings us to the whole you know discussion about philosophy locke's subjectivity uh, the whole idea of association of ideas now uh, there are of course two schools of thought here Uh, for a long time it was felt that uh, uh, stern has used uh, locke's idea especially as expressed in the essay concerning human understanding and uh, the knowledge is based on experience where you know knowledge is based on simple and complex ideas simple ideas gained through sense experience and complex ideas that are broken in a sense into simple ones and uh, ludwig hartley explains that you know uh, you know he may have uh, used dramatized and burlesqued ideas from locke and i think this is uh, you know a very important point of entry from uh, you know 20th century criticism that uh, for a writer of the 18th century and a writer like stern who from the very first page is contesting you know established words meanings and genres uh, it is uh, to actually think that he's taking lockean ideas and lockean philosophy just straight on would be very very um, uh, facile in a sense because we have to understand that uh, he's using it dramatizing it and he's also trying to burlesque it so he's also kind of uh, you know making fun of some of these things so it, it it and the term that is used is that there are various handles in a sense uh, you know to look at the way lock is used in the text because uh, be it chance be it custom whatever associates the idea uh, stern's creation and construction of an interrupted narrative is very central to the text so for instance we have use of you know there's a full blank page black page at the end of book 1 there are use of this use of latin words and it goes on you know left page has uh, the full page in latin and uh, you know you have the right page in english so in uh, volume 3 uh, then uh, you know you have uh, the asterisks they they are used uh, very frequently especially in volume 5 uh, the use of lines in volume 6 so you know early on in the development of the novel i think stern here is asking how do we read these symbols that when we read the word that is written how do we read a symbol when it when we come across it when we stumble uh, you know 
you know uh, onto a symbol in a written text how do we pronounce that symbol how do we read that symbol so this this the question of the script only to be understood in terms of a written word is being contested and here uh, you know our uh, two um, uh, you know uh, these are from the text itself uh, the use of the lines and the use of uh, you know the whip for instance in the whip uh, is suddenly kind of uh, presented in terms of uh, the uh, drawing of the whip so uh, uh, i would uh, want to request professor prakash to actually uh, discuss this particular aspect of uh, uh, you know stern's style where uh, the written word is continually interrupted but the point is already excellently made by you regarding you know how a novel is written and a novel is not written through uh, just words a novel is written through uh, so much of information that the writer gets processing it uh, making a view of it and then putting it through words so the whole process seems to be to have been uh, you know uh, explored by by the author in the book and even even simple signs you know that appear in life they also say something so how to catch them there are certain sounds that one would have heard how how, how to make sense of them so all this is uh, goes into the making of the novel make, making of the substance of the novel and the writer is going into these aspects in the 18th century is really remarkable uh, we are we are discussing now in literary theory Uh, all all these questions that words are signs words are signals words are this words are that and then you know finally it's a text written on the page so the text written on the page is not done on one day it it starts you know uh, uh, much before the writer himself has come into being so all these philosophical questions and the second thing that i would like to say about uh, your discussion uh, so very rich in in, in content is that uh, stern has uh, learned a lot from his background he knows greek he knows latin he knows all the f- major philosophers and he's playing with them yes he he he's just taking views from there and he's representing them in a different manner that's one but uh, i was also curious to ask you uh, and enlighten us about uh, you use the word digression what exactly are digression and what is their role in this novel as well as generally yes in fact uh, that's that's uh, the next point that i've just uh, okay. come to which mm-hmm. is about digressions mm-hmm. so uh, and here this is uh, you know what stern himself has written about digressions in the novel mm-hmm. so he says uh, digressions incontestably are the sunshine they are the life the soul of reading take them out of this book for instance you might as well take the book along with them one cold eternal winter would rain in every page of it restore them to the winter he steps forth like a bridegroom so uh all hail and uh, you know i just read the last part all the dexterity he says the the craft is in the good cookery and management of them mm-hmm. how you manage the digressions so as to be not only for the advantage of the reader but also of the author whose distress in this matter is truly pitiable so of course i'm not going to go here into the humor in these lines but as he said the digressions are the sunshine really speaking they are indeed the soul uh, of the 18th century novel be it henry fielding or be it lawrence stern the fact that these writers move away from the main plot they continually negotiate i think with their own society and uh, stern does it on many levels i think he does it hugely at the level of philosophy and uh, it's interesting because this whole idea about uh, you know his uh, uh, you know i uh, kind of um, uh, making fun also of uh, what locke is saying or what other philosophers are saying is a uh, really something that comes up only with 20th century criticism so the digressions in this sense reflect uh and uh, you know present to the reader what is really speaking going on in the society of the times and uh, you're looking at stern the digressions are really speaking more important than the plot because there is no plot and he's saying that you know when you write you have to uh, if you're writing a history or you're writing about the life and the opinions mm-hmm. then all this that is presented in the uh, you know world of the characters Uh, or in the world of you know when we talk about Tristram Shandy Shandyism if we are to co- coin that word mm-hmm. would include not just what happens in the Shandy household but Shandyism is then all these digressions as well so uh, uh, would you would you uh, kind of agree there uh, uh, yes yes this is the point that one should make regarding digressions digressions are subjects that occur to the protagonist that occur to the writer that that occur to other characters and they all face you know those those, those subjects so uh, somebody would like to know a, a reader today would like to know as to how you know these ideas 
worked in the minds of the people at that point of time. So, uh, there are writers, uh, uh, Fielding is another writer yes. who uses digressions to good effect. Sometimes there are independent essays and uh, the third thing regarding digressions is that uh, the 18th century is the century of digression, yes. short essays. You know, the, the periodicals have appeared, that the, there are parties and those parties are being discussed in, in, in society and uh, when they are discussed then their policies are discussed. On each policy uh, an, an essay can be written and uh, how to avoid all this, you know, from, from the plot of the novel. No. And uh, also, uh, you raised the question of the plot, what is a plot? Plot is a sequence of incidents and starting from one place to another, etc. But when, when this kind of a road is mapped, you know, on the, on, on, on the page, then uh, much is left on the sides. And the writer has to take care of the sides also. Yes. So, they are the digressions in my opinion. How, how, how do you uh, yourself interpret digressions? No, uh, completely <laughs> because I think digressions, if you look at, let's say for instance in the 18th century, we look at the development of uh, Joseph Andrews, mm -hmm. we look at the development of Tom Jones or in this case we look at within quotes the development of you know Tristram because Tristram is really speaking as protagonist not uh, really there. But if we look at this then I think what these writers are saying in the 18th century is that what they are doing and the way they are responding mm -hmm. is closely related to the society to which they belong. And it is that making, it is that process of the making of the character that can be understood through the digressions. So, society also is the protagonist in the novel? I think the main protagonist in most of these novels. And this protagonist is captured through digressions? Yes, this protagonist oh. is captured through digressions. Th that is a good point, yes. I would really think that this protagonist mm. is captured through digressions and uh, for instance, you know, in again, uh, uh, Lawrence Stern, uh, you know, in a letter to Stephen Croft, writes about noses. Now, in the, in the novel, uh, there is a reference to uh, noses. We of course know that you know Tristram's own nose is kind of flattened and he says that you know uh, uh, because uh, the principal satire throughout that part where he talks about noses is leveled at those learned blockheads who in all ages have wanted their time and much learning upon points as foolish. So, uh, you know, uh, th this is uh, really speaking what he says and uh, uh, th so which is wha what he tries to do. So, it is enough uh, if I divide the world he says at least I will rest contented with it. So, um, uh, this, this also kind of brings us you know here the digressions are to do with you know Christopher Ricks points out to do with law, with history, psychology, science and all these are judged uh, you know by literature. And I think Ricks makes a very important point that Stern is using literature, is using the process of fictionality itself to kind of bring in digressions on law, history, psychology, philosophy, science, everything actually really speaking in a nine volume novel that really he can lay his hands on. So, it shows that you know literature might not be the be all and end all of human existence as Rick says, but it shows that there is no substitute for uh, literature and he's you know the discourse of Shandyism is being kind of understood through this. So, this brings us actually to make just one or two very quick points. It brings us back to the narrative and I would just like to highlight four major points. One, Chris Tristram's birth happens in the countryside owing to the marriage settlement and uh, you know it, it does not take place in London. So, and uh, it leads of course to you know Dr. Slop who pulls off you know flattens Tristram's nose by using the forceps. The second point is about Tristram's name and this is the name that his father Walter did not want. It is the one name that he did not want and the name that he wanted was Tris Magistus and owing to you know the uh, maid's confusion, Susanna's confusion, she does not remember Tris Magistus and it comes to Tristram, the one name that was not you know desired. Then the accidental circumcision of Tristram and a very important aspect of this novel, the writing of what is called Tristrapedia. Now, if we look at it, you know, we just discussed digressions and we discussed uh, the use of symbols and blank lines and dashes and so on. So, for instance, you know, uh, Bobby's death in the novel, there are blank dashes in two lines and suddenly there is a statement that says he's gone, said my uncle Toby. So, uh, you know how that also kind of uh, uh, pans out the emotion and makes us look at it very objectively and, you know, almost makes it humorous. Then is uh, the whole idea of the Tristrapedia or the system of education. 
where Walter wants to, you know, after the brother's death, after Tristram's brother's death, he wants to write about uh, a system of education for his son. And what he does is he only ends up ignoring his own child. So uh, for those three years and the work is only halfway through. So, you know, this idea about what really speaking education means. And this brings us to, you know, the, the last statement in this particular, no particular novel, which says, uh, Lord said my mother, what is all this story about? A cock and a bull, said Yorick, and one of the best of the kind I ever heard. So I think I would just like to end on this note because it's so aptly put that it's a cock and a bull, uh, said Yorick, and one of the best of its kind I ever heard. So from the body to, you know, contesting all these notions of, uh, you know, the beginning and uh, characterization, protagonist, I think uh, the last statement really sums it all up. Well, uh, uh, viewers, we have come to the end of the discussion and uh, Dr. Payar Nagpal has gone over uh, a variety of aspects of the novel and uh, in fact the very idea of the beginning and the ending and, and, and the development is being questioned in the novel, in the, in the, in the body of the question. So uh, where, where, where are we there? Uh, are, are, we, are we learning anything? Is learning important? And uh, well, in, in, is, is learning possible? So all these questions, you know, become uh, prominent in this novel. And uh, uh, let me tell you again, this novel was written not recently, but 300 years ago, uh, 250 years ago in the 18th century, when you know it was 18th century itself was uh, in, in the process of making what would become 19th and 20th centuries. So this kind of novel is unique in English literature and I think uh, this kind of a novel would not be easily available in other languages also. So thanks Dr. Kumar Nagpal for giving such an excellent lecture and uh, viewers you uh, discuss these questions among yourselves, think about them and reach your own conclusions. Thank you.